Greetings, students. Mr. Little here, and today we're going to talk a little bit about the Cold War. We're going to talk about a part of the Cold War that's not usually addressed. We're going to talk about the non-aligned movement. Now, if you've ever heard the term third world, you might think about a place that experiences severe economic disenfranchisement or perhaps a lack of infrastructure or development. However, did you know that the term third world was actually used to describe nations that did not want to be part of the two power system during the Cold War? By looking at these nations, we can gain a new perspective on how the Cold War went and what role various countries played in it. And that's what we're going to do today. So strap on in. By the end of this presentation, you'll be able to answer the two following questions. How did the creation of the non-aligned movement reflect fundamental economic and political shifts after World War II? And how did the non-aligned movement seek to change the international economic and political systems during the Cold War? So we've got a change uh, as well as a causation question here. What exactly the non-aligned movement is? So I'm going to use the term NAM going forward just to keep it simple. So NAM is a group of states rejecting membership in a power block. That's this most basic definition. They don't want to be with the USA and they don't want to be with the Soviet Union. They they reject the Cold War dichotomy. They have a number of additional principles, such as independence for their members, as well as the territorial integrity of their members, meaning that you are not allowed to simply change the borders when you feel like it. In addition, they stand against imperialism. For most of NAM's history, many states were still under formal imperialism, neocolonialism, racism, and intervention in other countries' affairs. Uh, NAM countries are from Latin America, Africa, and parts of Asia. And in general, they are either former colonies or they're states that were under heavy U.S. or British economic imperialism throughout the 19th and into the 20th century. And usually these are raw material exporting or semi-industrializing nations. If you remember that core periphery model I talked about during Unit 5 and Unit 6 videos, these were nations on the periphery exporting their goods back to the core nations of Europe. That's a good way to kind of visualize that. I'm going to show you a map in just a second. But NAM is still around today. And as of 2020, uh, it has 120 members and 17 observer nations. It represents 66% of the countries in the United Nations and 55% of the world's population. And that doesn't include China, by the way, as an official member. So for the sake of this presentation, I'm going to use NAM, Third World, and Global South interchangeably, although these are technically different things and they don't overlap perfectly. Just for the sake of this presentation, we're going to use these terms interchangeably. If you're really curious, I would encourage you to do a little bit of research on your own. So as you can see from this map here, the current members of NAM are in dark blue. And so that's almost all of Africa, large chunks of Latin America, as well as South and Southeast Asia and the Middle East. Uh, you can see some observer members in light blue, that is, they come to meetings, but they don't have an actual say. Now, the thing about NAM is that NAM did not start out as such a formal uh, institutional body within the United Nations. The origins of NAM can be traced back uh, roughly to two different conferences, one of which happened even before World War II called the Brussels Conference. And what this was, was a group of anti-imperial activists who came together to form something called the League Against Imperialism, fought for and demanded home rule for colonies. So while the Brussels Conference could be seen as the forerunner to the NAM movement, most historians point to the Bandung Conference or the Africa-Asia Conference of 1955, which was held in Indonesia. Now, the stated purpose of this conference was to bring together closer cooperation between the nations of Africa and Asia in opposing colonialism and the then sort of developing Cold War. Now, of the 29 nations that came to the meeting, they represented, get this, 55% of the world's population. And they represented a variety of new state systems and values, everything from democracies to monarchies to single party states, and even a few states that were espousing what we might consider communism. Nonetheless, they all wanted to come together to reject the idea of a bipolar world where you have to pick one or you have to pick the other. As the leader of a newly independent Burma, UNU, described the conference, said it was, quote, one large solidarity pact for the nations of Africa and Asia. Even though these nations did not have much in the way of military power, military might, they didn't have jet fighters or nuclear weapons, J.N. Kodsa, a diplomat who represented India at the conference, described these nations as having a kind of moral power, representing half the population of the earth. They had a sort of moral power they could use to try to leverage against the larger nations of the Soviet Union and the United States. Now, the conference had a number of participants and a number of discussions, but the Bandung Declaration that came out of the conference did a couple of things. One is that it reaffirmed the United Nations Charter. The United Nations, which had been created by mostly the North Atlantic powers, the United States, the Soviet Union. And they said, we affirm these rights as well. We, who at the time didn't have a say uh, in the creation of these rights, because they were created in 1945 before most of these nations were independent, uh, reaffirm these as well. We're just sort of claiming the United Nations Charter as our own. They also criticized the formation of power blocks, right? They criticized NATO. They criticized the Warsaw Pact. And they criticized nations who had joined NATO or the Warsaw Pact, seeing these two different power blocks as a danger to peace to start another world war. If you remember World War I alliances, 
were a big part of starting that war. They also called for racial equality and an end to colonialism and imperialism, because in 1955, even though decolonization had started, it was very early on in most places in Africa were still being ruled by imperial powers. You can see from this map here the number of states that attended the Bandung Conference. Many of these would later go on to join the non-aligned movement. But you can see how it represented uh, large chunks of Africa and Asia coming together to make a solid declaration of unity and principle. Even though it represented a number of political systems, everything from communist to democratic to monarchist to single party rule, that all these nations came together to oppose the formation of power blocks. So while Brussels and Bandung are usually looked at as the spiritual forerunners of the NAM movement, the first official NAM conference was the Belgrade Conference in 1961, six years after Bandung. And this came in the context of a really intensifying Cold War. So not only did now both sides have massive nuclear weapons, but they were building them bigger and this is the middle of the space race too. So not only do we have big nukes, now we're trying to put them in space too. And just like at Bandung, you had a number of leaders from a variety of historical situations coming together to make this common declaration, this plea for sanity in a world that seemed to be going mad. So for example, you had Joseph Tito, ruler of Yugoslavia, who hosted the conference. Even though he was a communist, he did not fall into the influence of the Soviet Union. You had Gamal Nasser of Egypt, who was viewed as the leader of the Arab world for his tough stand against the British, French, and Israelis during the Suez crisis. And you had Huneru, the leader of India, who was a longtime disciple of Gandhi and perceived as sort of the leader of a nonviolent movement. In terms of formalizing NAM, the Belgrade Conference put together a series of membership requirements, a membership checklist, if you will, which included not being aligned with one of the major superpowers, agreeing not to interfere in any of your neighbor's affairs, as well as always agreeing and pushing for a peaceful resolution to any dispute that might exist. Now, quickly glancing at the history of the 20th century, you know this did not always happen. At least coming together to declare these things as goals to strive for was a pretty radical notion at a time when the United States and the USSR were willy-nilly intervening in whatever nation's business they thought was necessary to secure their Cold War interests, whether that was Korea, Vietnam, or Latin America. The first NAM conference produced a document that had 27 points or 27 goals, that, and there's a couple of really interesting ones. One of them was to completely dismantle all nuclear weapons, quote, in order to save mankind. This is a time when a movement that would later represent half the world's population came together and said, hey, could we maybe not destroy the earth? That would be great. Thanks. In addition, they also pushed for an end to the economic imbalances left over from imperialism. And they even called on the creation of a United Nations Capital Development Fund. In other words, nations who had been economically exploited under imperial rule should get some sort of compensation for their lost resources, the destruction of their social institutions, as well as any sort of damage to their environment. And although the UN Capital Development Fund has not fulfilled many of the hopes and dreams of those who proposed it making these demands, it's an assertion of agency we usually leave out of the Cold War narrative. And one of the final and most interesting points was the demand to democratize the United Nations. You have to remember that the United Nations had been created by the Western allies after World War II, along with the Soviet Union and some Latin American countries, but it really had been dominated by Western European countries and the United States. And the one of the goals of NAM was to increase the participation of the non-Western countries and the newly independent countries, as well as just getting some of their members in. So for example, uh, the United States was embargoing mainland China from having its seat uh, in the United Nations because their ally in Taiwan was holding on to that seat. We would see an expansion of the UN Security Council as a result of some of the lobbying and protesting done by NAM members. NAM would really use the UN to try to influence world affairs. <clears throat> this is what Jay and Colsa had meant when he talked about how Bandung and the non-aligned movement had the moral authority of the world because they represented the majority. And so the Belgrade Conference really outlined sort of a agenda for NAM. That is, not only is it going to steer clear of both the Soviet Union and the United States, but it's going to push its own agenda. It's going to push for denuclearization, the democratization of the United Nations, as well as supporting each other's independent economic development, but pushing for compensation for, for the years under imperial rule. And here is a map of the 1961 Non-Aligned Conference. Again, if you take this map and compare it to the Bandung Conference map, you can see a little bit of overlap between the members who attended this conference and the members who attended the Non-Aligned Movement Conference in 1961. So let's talk a little bit about NAM's actual role as it relates to the Cold War. So as I said before, NAM's role was officially to not join one of the two major power blocks during the Cold War. That said, it's not like they didn't exactly play a role. So for example, NAM formed a majority within the United Nations very quickly. As I mentioned before, they pushed to expand the seats on the Security Council so that they could have more of a say in the deployment of United Nations peacekeeping forces, as well as other United Nations actions. It's also notable that many NAM countries provided peacekeepers for many UN peacekeeping forces. Many UN peacekeeping forces were led by NAM country commanders. And so in this respect, NAM played a part in global politics during the Cold War. 
in attempting to, to define a ground between the United States and the Soviet Union. For example, this picture right here on the right shows uh, Yugoslav soldiers as part of the UN peacekeeping force to Egypt after the Suez War. And despite the fact that NAM officially sought to stay away from both sides, NAM was very anti-colonialism. NAM members would often provide support to anti-colonial causes, such as ending apartheid in South Africa. They were some of the first groups to push for an embargo against South Africa that would weaken it and eventually lead to the collapse of apartheid. They also provided both moral and material support for anti-colonial activism against the Portuguese. Now, the Portuguese, among all the decolonizing powers, held on to their colonial empire the longest, their empire only being dismantled in 1975. And so, for example, in the Angolan Civil War, which was a major theater in Africa during the Cold War, NAM provided material and moral support for the People's Liberation Movement of Angola, the MPLA, which indirectly put them in conflict with the United States, who supported a different faction of that civil war. And it's worth noting, especially with the election of Fidel Castro as the leader of NAM, even though officially NAM was not aligned, it oftentimes had more sympathy with what we might call roughly, and with a very broad brush, uh, the quote-unquote communist side of the Cold War. Not that it necessarily had any love for the Soviet Union, but just in general, uh, decolonization, autonomy, and preventing foreign aggression was something that NAM stood for. And during the Cold War, the country that was most overtly interfering in the affairs of others was the United States and, to a lesser extent, uh, Great Britain and France. That said, Fidel Castro, the leader of communist Cuba, who was very much friendly and very much aligned with the Soviet Union, when he became the leader of NAM, he tried to turn it into a more of an independent force to be used against the superpower bloc, something that could stand more on its own and didn't necessarily need the United Nations to do anything. However, shortly after his election, the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan. It was a member of NAM. This totally split NAM members because Fidel Castro attempted to justify the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, whereas many members of NAM saw this as uh, blanket aggression. So while NAM may not have been like picking sides or playing sides in the Cold War, they continued to play a role through both the United Nations and their support for decolonization movements. In addition to playing a role in the Cold War through the United Nations, um, NAM members also sought to readjust the international economic structure by, in a number of avenues. So for example, within the United Nations, 77 NAM members who represented what we called developing countries, that is, countries that continue to primarily export their raw materials to industrialized nations, formed something called the Group of 77. They pushed the UN to create a study group known as the Conference on Trade and Development, which periodically meets even to this day, in order to discuss the issues and find solutions for how developing countries can further develop down the road. However, it's this situation that many NAM countries found themselves in. Even after they were formally granted their independence, they often continued the economic arrangement they had had with their colonial master. And that is they exported their raw materials to the industrialized countries as their main source of income. Now, these countries wanted to rapidly develop. They wanted to build schools, roads, hospitals, factories, power plants. They wanted to make the lives of their citizens better. They couldn't do this, though, if all they had to export were raw materials. That price could fluctuate wildly. And potentially, your North Atlantic buyer could just go to someone else and buy it cheaper if you tried to raise the price. It was in this economic frame in the 1970s that NAM pushed for something called the New International Economic Order. And I know it sounds like a conspiracy your grandpa talks about at Thanksgiving. But essentially, it was a framework. It wasn't a set list of goals, but it was a framework by which countries in the global south could get fairer prices for their raw materials, such as petroleum, tungsten, aluminum, bauxite, possibly even forming cartels to control the price of these goods being sold to the north, uh, as well as demanding an end to some uh, debt obligations created during imperialism. You might remember Haiti having to pay France for its independence, as well as un what we call unconditional technology transfers. This was the demand that northern countries <clears throat> provide members of the global south with things such as agricultural technology, medical technology, and uh, power technology, such as nuclear power unconditionally, not having to buy it, not having to pay for it, but as reparations for imperialism, uh, providing them with this technology to give them the chance to develop as well. This has actually come up recently in 2020 with the spread of COVID around the world. Many nations in the global South are pushing for the WTO to lift its restrictions on intellectual property and allow them to make copies of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine. And funny thing is there actually is a clause in the World Trade Organization's intellectual property laws that allow intellectual property claims to be suspended during a pandemic, but nothing has come to this so far. Now, while this framework was somewhat radical, uh, northern industrial countries pretty much were able to get around it by just ignoring it and not being willing to engage with it. So the United States President Ronald Reagan, Prime Minister of Great Britain Margaret Thatcher, and Chancellor of Germany Helmut Schmidt uh, simply ignored the, the NIEO, uh, and effectively it became a dead letter. In 1981, at an international economics conference in Cancun, Mexico, President Ronald Reagan basically said, you know, uh, we're just not going to negotiate. We're not going to talk about this anymore. And uh, that was the end of that. A number of scholars have pointed out that it's around this time when we see the emergence of what we call neoliberalism or an ideology that the market 
the popularization globally of an ideology called neoliberalism, that is where government policies and international bodies should promote free trade, free markets over anything else, be that environmental concerns, social concerns, or poverty concerns. So this is usually the failure of the NIEO is seen as the beginning of the neoliberal age. And while the NIEO might have been a failure, a number of NAM members actually had some success forming a commodity cartel in the form of OPEC, or the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, who are mostly, but not all, NAM members. Now, OPEC is what we call a commodity cartel. It controls the the sale, production, and price of a certain commodity. In this case, the members of OPEC currently control about 50% of all oil production and 90% of all known oil reserves. Now, probably their highest moment of success was 1973. In response to US support for Israel during the Yom Kippur War, they effectively embargoed the United States uh, from oil. And this created a crisis situation in America uh, for several months in 1973 and really demonstrated the potential power of a commodity cartel, at least initially, uh, to force the global north to pay attention to the global south. Now, since then, OPEC has been dominated by infighting uh, price wars between members, and it has not had the power that it had in 1973. Nonetheless, the NIEO and OPEC represent how the non-aligned movement attempted to shift the global economic situation during the Cold War, and how, while it's true that there was one side of the Cold War advocating communism and the other side of the Cold War advocating capitalism, there was a group in the middle that was just trying to say, hey, we'd like to build a better life for our citizens. Could we talk about restructuring the global economic order? And not with the use of nukes, I might add. The 1973 oil embargo had a negative unintended consequence on many NAM members, and that is the increase in the price of oil made it more expensive to import their raw materials. And as a result, many NAM countries saw a decrease in the demand for their raw materials, and hence their income plummeted, forcing them taking out a number of loans, a huge amount of debt, which turned into a crisis in the 1980s when there was an interest rate spike. But by the 1980s, many NAM countries were in a horrible debt crisis in which they were no longer even able to pay the interest on their debt. And it's at this time that the International Monetary Fund steps into the picture. Now, the IMF had actually been founded after World War II. Officially, its job was, quote, to foster global growth and economic stability, but it wasn't actually ever clear what that meant. But after the 1970s, uh, the IMF changes its mission. As an international financing body, it becomes the global assurer of a nation's credit. So the IMF can help a nation get a loan uh, to pay off debt or to come out of a disaster, uh, but it also is going to assure that nation's credit. And they're going to do this by only giving out loans with conditions. And these are well, they have a bunch of different names, but they're broadly called structural adjustment loans or structural adjustment programs. What happened with the debt crisis is that many NAM nations went to the IMF for a loan in order to get themselves out of this debt crisis. IMF only gave out these loans with the accompanying structural adjustment programs. And what that means is that it was an end to what the IMF referred to as wasteful or corrupt local spending. This included things like import substitution programs, uh, social welfare programs, and in general, opening up a nation to more trade. Now, in the IMF, IMF's defense, there was a lot of localized corruption in some of these NAM countries, and some of that spending was probably wasteful or not efficient. On the other hand, these IMF loans made it very difficult for NAM countries to effectively develop their own economies anymore. They became a player in a globalized market. And in this globalized market, many nations only wanted their raw materials and didn't actually care if their people uh, saw a better development. One uh, interesting example of this would be the case of Jamaica. Now, Jamaica had a leader in the 1970s named Michael Manley who attempted to uh, develop Jamaica as an independent economic power. Jamaica has a very important raw material called bauxite. And what Michael Manley tried to do is form a bauxite cartel so that Jamaica could get what he considered a fair price for their raw material. However, the United States and other northern countries undercut his attempt to form a cartel by simply buying bauxite cheaper from Australia. And as a result, Jamaica found itself in a great deal of debt during the 1980s. Michael Manley lost an election. The new leader welcomed the IMF to Jamaica uh, with its structural adjustment program. And Jamaica has been working with the IMF for about 40 years now. Uh, and the results are, are somewhat mixed. While poverty has gone down, Jamaicans' real wages have actually declined. That said, the life expectancy has gone up. So in terms of the ability of IMF loans to positively affect a country's direction, uh, the jury is still out. Close to the end of the Cold War, international financial bodies, such as the IMF, helped pave the way for globalization by opening up countries to the global market, even if this didn't actually make the lives of their citizens better in all cases. If you're a big reggae fan, by the way, you may want to go listen to Bob Marley's 1976 song, Crazy Bald Heads, which is all about, which is a reference to IMF financiers coming in and taking a greater control of Jamaica's domestic financial affairs. In the second decade of the 21st century, many Western politicians are very concerned about something called China's Belt and Road System, a trade and economic network that China is building across Eurasia and the Indian Ocean. But the way that China is getting countries to sign up for the Belt and Road System is by 
posing as an alternative to the IMF. Many nations recognize that the IMF had strings attached to their money, but China doesn't have strings attached to their money. And whether you think that's a good thing or a bad thing, China's Belt and Road system can be seen as an alternative to the IMF by many nations in financial need or in financial distress. China has demands of its own, but China doesn't demand that nations change their internal domestic politics in order to get a loan from Beijing. So for all the roles that NAM played during the Cold War, NAM was unfortunately plagued by a number of weaknesses. And probably chief among them was that it wasn't necessarily a solid unified body. It pushed for unified objectives such as the NIEO framework or for nuclear disarmament, but not being able to act and not being able to effectively force anything apart from moral pressure, NAM was effectively unable to act uh, during the Cold War to stop either side from committing violence. For example, NAM was not able to stop the United States from bombing Vietnam, which was one of its own members, or stop the Soviet Union from invading Afghanistan, which was also one of its members. And sometimes you even had intermember conflict that neither side could resolve, the Chinese-Indian War in 1962 or the Tanzania-Uganda War in 1979. Although NAM would push for peaceful resolutions, it could never effectively step in and prevent violence. And this is in part because of their very strict policy about non-intervention. They believed that each member was strictly sovereign and would, could not be intervened in. But this also meant that there would be no effort to prevent what we would consider human rights violations or genocide. So for example, Indonesia's massacre of its entire communist party in 1965, which consisted of half a million to a million people, as well as Saddam Hussein's increasingly brutal crackdowns on democracy in Iraq in the 1970s, these were not to be interfered with. Many NAM countries came to be ruled by single party states or by the military. And whether this might be good or bad or necessary or not necessary, uh, a lack of accountability that comes with at least nominally democratic systems uh, meant that there was an increase in corruption and conflict within these countries. In addition, even though NAM was officially non-aligned with either the Soviet Union or the United States, that didn't mean that NAM members didn't occasionally go to one side to get supplies, in particular weapons, for a war it might have like with a local rival, such as in the Ogaden War, when Ethiopia asked the Soviet Union for help against Somalia, or the Iraq-Iran War, in which Iraq, although nominally a, a friend of the Soviet Union's, uh, asked the United States for weapons to fight Iran. In addition to these political failings, most NAM members were members of the Global South, and they were not able to put any effective pressure on the industrialized North to change any of its policies on trade or the price of goods. This includes the inability to form commodity cartels and the inability to stabilize prices of raw materials, which could impact a member's ability to steer its own economic development away from exporting raw materials. NAM still exists today, as I said at the very beginning of the presentation, and since the end of the Cold War, it's been trying to reorient itself. In particular, it's been a large voice for what we call global self-determination, in particular the right of Puerto Rico, the people of the Palestinian territories, and Western Sahara to determine their own future. It has opposed U.S. military hegemony in certain parts of the world, such as protesting the 2003 invasion of Iraq. Despite this, most scholars and political observers believe that the ability to inspire, or the moral authority that NAM might have possessed at the Bandung Conference, that moral power to make the world listen. It has been damaged through 50 years of uh, corruption, inability to stop conflict, and a failure to deliver on many of the economic promises the NAM nations made to their people. And so while NAM might still exist today, perhaps the idea of NAM and what NAM stood for and what it could be uh, might need some renewing. But anyways, that is a history, that's a very brief overlook at the roles and impact of the formation and economic and political impact of the non-aligned movement during the Cold War. I wanna thank you for joining me. You should definitely be able to answer those two questions from the beginning of the presentation. My name is Mr. Little and I'll see you next time.